Hey gang, I'm Nikki LaCroce and you're listening to Who the Fuck. And today I'm sharing the mic with Troy Hadid. And Troy has taught yoga internationally for 15 years plus, and he's founded several successful businesses and is also the author of the soon to be released book, My Name is Love, which I have absolutely so much gratitude for at this point in my life. Troy has quite the wealth of life experience, having walked coast to coast across Central America, navigating the world by ship, and has spent prolonged periods in silence, which I personally can't imagine. But (laughs) Troy much like myself, hopes that his life will assist others in rediscovering their relationship and understanding of themselves. And Troy also really emphasizes the importance of understanding our relationship with God and what that means so we can embody more compassion and understanding and love for one another. So welcome to the show, Troy. Yeah, uh, absolute pleasure, Nikki. It's so good to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. So this is a conversation I've been really excited to have. I feel like when we initially met, I wasn't really sure what to expect because I mean, you have such a variety of life experiences and the thing that you've done, I think to really create a real immense level of comfort in the conversation is just showing up from that place of love. And so your book, my name is love is really a memoir coupled with insights and some teachings and questions to provide introspection to each of us. So before we dive fully into your backstory, um, can you share a little bit about what inspired the book and and what you're hoping to kind of provide to readers in the context of your own experiences? Yeah. Um, as to what, what um, inspired the book, Nikki, when I was really young, I think I must have been like 21 years old when I said, I'm going to write a book one day. And I always knew I would write a book. And I, I wanted to, in university, I wanted to major in philosophy and writing. And my dad said, no way, you're going to do business. So um, it, it's so funny that over the last 20 some years, you know, I've found my way to and through yoga and so many different philosophical avenues, insights, introspection, experiences, and now here I am. And I've, I've taken all of that and I've I've produced this, what to me is a really amazing book, and I've, I've come to a point where, you know what? People are going to like it or not like it. It'll connect to some people, it won't connect to others. But this is my entire heart in this book, and I can stand by it with my eyes closed. And um, something within me wanted this to be heard and be read, and that's all that matters. Yeah. And to to answer your question more specifically, I, you know, I don't, I don't believe in doing anything for me that I don't think is going to help connect people to their understanding of God and give us the tools to understand a little bit more what it actually means to love one another and how we can do that. So for me, that would be my intention with this book. That is that that is my primary agenda and intention is um, for us to sometime, some, somehow kind of get over ourselves a little bit, get our head out of our own ass. Yeah. Bit, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I think you do a great job with that. The thing that I feel comes across so immediately in the book and through just the direction that you take your writing and to your point, your philosophy, because I think that's really a big part of this. I I have a very philosophical mind and, and soul myself. So, so many parts of your story in the book resonate with me. Your real emphasis at the onset is around that connectivity and that desire to sort of shed the idea of I and me and think more holistically as a we. And I'm highlighting this book all over the place, like being like, oh, that's that's something I want to keep in mind. That's something I want to keep in mind. But at a high level, human connection is the thing that I thrive on the most. And, and that's so much of what you are writing about. So can you share a little bit about what you mean when you consider how we're more connected than we could imagine and how that relates to our relationship with God? I realize that's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, very, very loaded. And, you know, it's, it's as you know, Nikki, the very, very first chapter in the book is called Redefining God. And 
part of me was like, are you crazy? You're going to, first chapter, first chapter. Like, you just got to get gonna, it out of the way, though. You got to get it out of the way. Yeah. People are going to close this book and be like, blasphemy. <laughs> and um, and here's the thing. I could understand why. Like, like I see any book, I completely understand why someone might have resistance to the word God. But regardless of what each individual views as God or divinity or spirit or whatever you want to call it, whatever energy or, I don't know, energy or personality or whatever someone wants to associate with this idea of something bigger than themselves, it is the one thing that connects all of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The one, it's the one thing that connects all of us. So I, I felt it really important to give people the, the permission, for less, lack of a better word, to redefine their own understanding of spirit and their own relationship to God. Because without that, then we're separate. Well, I love that. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I love that that is how you let in with the book because I am someone, so you were raised Catholic. I was as well. Yeah. I never really had a strong relationship to religion. I kind of just did what I was supposed to do. I, I went and I did the classes and I did all the sacraments and all that stuff. And once I didn't have to anymore, I was kind of disengaged. And so when I started reading your book, I love that you preface it with, you know, you're not trying to really convince anybody of what they should believe God is. What you're trying to do is expose the fact that regardless of what you call it, what we feel about it is really the thing that drives us together. And you speak specifically to the resistance that some of us have to calling some sort of divinity God. And yeah. I understand that because being raised Catholic, I feel like I have a preconceived notion of what God is. And because, as you point out in various points in your book, what people have sort of made God out to be and using it, kind of weaponizing religion, quite honestly, um, to yeah. isolate people and create um, chaos. It To me, it's like we start to conflate religion and God and what you do is try to peel that apart in a very delicate way that I think gives people a sense of comfort and calm in in redefining that. In particular, I found that for myself because I I, I was a few pages into your book and being like, well, I have a complicated relationship with what I believe God to be, you know, and it, yeah. I'm at a point in my life where I can recognize that and be able to sort of step back and say, OK, I will refer to something really as like the universe um, as opposed to God. But when I'm speaking about faith, it's sort of all the same thing. And so I really respect that you led with that. And frankly, I think it was probably strategically a smart move because, listen, the people who are open minded will continue going forward in the book and the people who aren't, they're not your audience. And at the end of the day, yeah. like that's really what you're hoping to glean from it. Right. You don't want to get people yeah. 200 pages into your book and then have them be like, oh, wait a second. Never mind forget about it. It's like you're you're leading with this really important part at the onset to say, if you're open to this, then I, then you can be open to the other concepts that you're bringing forward in the book. Yeah, it was also really important as well because I use the word God. So you need to understand what I mean when I say God. Absolutely. You know, because throughout the book, I mean, it's not a God book, but at the same time, it's a kind of spirit book. You know, yeah, it's, definitely. It, it is in a lot of ways. And I want to, I, I know people have this, this re, a lot of people have this resistance, this trauma around the word God, which I understand. And, you know, someone once asked me, I think I may have mentioned this in books, someone once asked me, well, do you think it's important for us to use the word God? Can I use divinity or Gaia or spirit or Mother Nature or whatever? And uh, my response was this, absolutely. You can call God Jim, Jim, John, whatever you want, because it's your relationship to God, right? Right. But for me, I also, for me, it's important to use the word God. 
Because if I don't use the word God, then I can't redefine and correct the misalignments that have been done in the name of it. And if I don't use it with God, it's almost like I create more separation between myself and those that do. Mm-hmm. And I personally am not willing to leave anyone behind. Like this is not an exclusive understanding of divinity. Mm-hmm. Um, it includes everyone. And to me, any true understanding of God or divinity must. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I, that, and the fact that you point that out the way that you do, I feel speaks a lot to the open-mindedness that you also have, because you speak about conversations you had with people who identify as atheists, trying to understand, you know, what is it, what is it that creates this resistance? And what I found really compelling in the experiences that you've had in those conversations is that when you sort of isolate the concept of divinity from the word God, a lot of people will say that they believe the same thing. But as soon as you pull God into it, it starts to, as you said, sort of create some exclusivity um, rather than inclusivity. And I thought it was really bold the way that you call that out because so many people, um, you know, with glorified and very self-righteous opinions will sit there and talk about how God does accept this and he doesn't accept that. And it's just not how you bring people together, which is the ultimate goal in theory of religion and, and that type of connectivity. And I, I think what you do also really well is bridging the gap between the idea of, you know, separating the concept of organized religion from our belief in something greater than ourselves. Because the reality is, is that we are so small in the grand scheme of everything that exists. And what we sometimes lose sight of is how important our relationship to each other in the greater sense of things is. Um, So can you share a little bit about how you came to this place um, through your experiences of recognizing that not only did you want and need to redefine, allow people to redefine their relationship with God, but how you came to a place of recognizing that love is really the core of, of that message as well. Well, I, I think that, you know, that's been a, a journey since I was really young, but I think in more recent years, it's become really clear through my yoga practice, which is really like I explained to people, forget the postures, forget all that stuff. What yoga is, is it's quieting in mind and reconnecting, deepening our relationship to our breath. And it so happens that the word spirit comes from the Latin with spiritus, and it means to breathe. And go figure, it's the one thing that connects everything on the planet. It That's connects us. Yeah, it connects us more than ancestry, opinions, where we're from, religion, race, any of it. The air that is inside of me at some point, if not already, we, we exchange air molecules, Nikki, me and you on two different continents. I'm yeah. even on a little island, not even a continent. But, but you know, the air we breathe is one thing that connects all of us. And it was just so beautiful for me to, to contemplate for a moment that if that is some form of divine agency, it's in everyone, mm-hmm. you know, and the reason, sorry, I mentioned yoga is because it's very core of, of understanding of yogic living or, or, or philosophy is that God lives in everything. Yeah. That there, there is there, and if we can be in relationship with each other and every conversation, every interaction, even every conflict, be one we we're having with God, how different our lives would be. If yeah. we actually saw God in that drug addict on the street, or saw God in that homeless person on the street, or saw God in someone we were in conflict with. All of a sudden, it doesn't mean we could no longer be in conflict. It doesn't mean we can't draw our boundaries. It doesn't even mean we can't walk away. But it impacts how we do that. Yeah. You know, you can do those things in still a, a compassionate, loving way, you know? Totally. And I feel like that's just something that over the years I've 
learned as well and integrating it into your school of thought around our oneness is offers a lot of really valuable perspective for me because I went through a really bad divorce and and just sort of relationship overall. And it's taken me a lot of time to come to a place of compassion and grace um, for my ex. And I wouldn't say I'm a hundred percent there if I'm being completely honest, but I think that I do in moments of tremendous frustration or resentment, try to revisit the humanity of the situation and recognize that we are all human beings. We are all part of this and that our experiences, our personal individual experiences in life will dictate a lot of the decisions that we make. And what I think you call out, um, you know, in, in your philosophy too, is that these things don't have to be as divisive as they are. And we yeah. have, I think, catered to the idea that the differences between us are a way to create community, even though it's sort of further uh, dispersing or dissipating the like more holistic, like the broader community among humanity. So it's like we have these pockets of people that we find ourselves identifying with and and wanting to create relationships with. But then that's sort of to the exclusion of the greater good. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, um, I think how I describe it in chapter chapter two is that, you know, we're we're born, we're born Nikki into a body and then we're given a name and we're told that's who we are. So then everything that revolves around our physical identity, be it opinions, ideologies, close circles, friends, family, all the things, even careers and what we do, all the things we identify with as individuals become part of our identity. But they all revolve around our individual identity, our mm-hmm. individual sense of being. And then we create these clusters, right? So groups or communities of people that believe the same thing or have the same skin color or whatever it is, have the same lifestyle, right? But then, and we see it as community, but then within that, there's still a we and a them. There's we who believe one thing and there's them who believe something else. And we still create separation and otherness. And just to lead to what you mentioned earlier, which I think is so important, the bulk of this is in chapter 15, which I know you haven't got to yet, but um, it speaks to our conditioning, right? And that is that if, if I understand that I am not my physical body, and by the way, there's no one that can convince me that I am my physical body, because I know I will exist after I leave my body. In some form, energetically or consciously, I will exist. So that means, therefore, I am not my body. Because if I exist beyond my body, in any form whatsoever, then I am not my body, right? And if I am not my body, I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. No, no, I'm into it. Keep going. (laughs) Yeah. Then Nikki can't actually do anything to me because I'm not my body, and Nikki's not her body. So so I I would invite us to see one another as seeds of God with condition. Mm. And everyone has a certain level and kind of conditioning. And you mentioned that in experiences, right? Someone can't love if they've never been loved. Or if you love their, their experience, it's conditional or emotionally reactive, or spiteful, then that's their understanding of love. If someone has never experienced real forgiveness, then how they don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. You know, I think think the biggest privilege in our world, you know, we talk about race, we talk about gender, we talk about sexual orientation, we talk about all these privileges, financial privileges. And they're all they're all on point. They're all really powerful things that need to be addressed and looked at. 
but the biggest privilege of our entire world. It's a privilege of love and security. Of knowing what love and security is, that shapes someone. Wow. Yeah, I... You know? It's such a profound point that you make, Troy. And I, over the years, have learned that. And I, I feel the way that you just explained it further validates those thoughts and feelings that I've had. Because when you're in a situation where, I mean, I just even think about the way that my parents raised me and considering things that when I was younger, maybe frustrated me about them or ways that they behaved. But since losing my mom, one of the things that I really recognized, and I just was moving some things out of my storage unit and going through like old cards and things like that, and seeing the messages of love that my parents have written over the years, and not just, you know, the card is written already, and they're just signing their name to it, but really expressing, you know, their gratitude for who I've become as a person and their love for me, you know, regardless of circumstances. And sometimes I think I was at war with what they would tell me versus what I felt. And that can be challenging. But when I look at it, what I've recognized, especially like even just with consideration to my ex that I mentioned, it's like I was raised in a very different type of environment. And the love that I received from my parents, from my family, from my friends supported me and my growth throughout the years, through the hardest moments of my life, I could anchor back to that. But my ex did not have that. My ex had some sort of conditional love, or even if it were unconditional, it was portrayed in a way that just wasn't safe. And I, I think that one of the hardest things as an individual that can be difficult to recognize is that our experience does not reflect the experience of everybody else. And because we're so isolated in that worldview of what we have and how we were raised and what we believe love to be or what we believe anything that we philosophically understand or believe to be, it's like that is through the lens with which we have the view. But what about somebody else? And what that ultimately comes back to is can we empathize with people who have had different lived experiences or who are in a position of, or a different level of growth or emotional awareness than we have? And I feel like it's just, it's such an eye-opening thing when you can recognize that and and step back and be a bit more objective, but it's not something that I feel like we're inherently ready to do because of the way that we're conditioned in the world. We focus on like what our life is and what we need to do for ourselves. And then if you have the means to do it, then you can kind of zoom out and start to see the bigger picture. Yeah. And and, um, I'm going to put a plus on that one. (laughs) Because get this, Nikki, it's like very often we're so stuck. I'm going to come back to identity to connect some dots, right? We're told that this body is who I am, right? And that's our unconscious program the day we're born. So naturally, our unconscious way of being is to protect this, my body and my identity with everything I have. Mm -hmm. So anything that threatens that, we want to judge, we want to make it wrong, we want to make it bad. So anytime we feel hurt, anytime we feel threatened, in any way, emotionally, physically, or otherwise, all of a sudden we judge that thing as bad. And in our relationships, a lot of times when we don't feel aligned with someone else's actions or thoughts or words or perspectives, we want to judge them and make them wrong. And we want to prove ourselves right. Yeah. But the thing is that if we really, we have to look at where that is coming from, right? Because if we truly want to help someone recondition and reprogram, then the very first thing we need to do is make them feel safe. Yeah. Make them feel safe, seen, and understood, you know? Yeah. I, gosh, I just feel like you're such a wealth of insight. <laughs> and the way that you express it is so accessible too. like you say it in a way that is simplified, but also not at all condescending. It's, it's sort of like a very matter of fact, calm. And I really appreciate and respect that Troy, because it is a difficult thing to 
ask people to look outside of themselves when we do have that just ingrained in us to be who we are and defend who we are. And you see the way that that shows up in our interpersonal relationships with like even just family members or spouses or something where you you made the comment, we just like, we want to prove that we're right. And sometimes it's not about whether or not you're right. Sometimes it's about just acknowledging the situation and being accountable and understanding. And we, it's moments like that where I feel like our, animalistic instincts take over and it's like and maybe it's not even and maybe it's sort of like the combination of the consciousness with the animal instinct which is like defend yourself like you said at all costs but also there's this through the work that I've done in therapy my feeling in most cases probably there's like this inner child within you that like felt like it wasn't safe to be wrong or that like somebody would condemn you for that or whatever it might be. And so we try to justify our behavior by referencing these previous points in our life that maybe aren't the correct set of data to be leveraging to answer that question. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, that my favorite one around that is the whole idea of survival of the fittest to say, well, it's human nature to, Put yourself first before everyone else, right? Yep. That's just our survival instinct. And my response to that is, well, everything else evolves. So on a spiritual, emotional level, aren't we also supposed to evolve beyond that? Because we can look way back as the, at the emotional um, capacity of of homo sapiens however long ago, and we could say, well, all right, yeah, sure, survival will be fittest, but we're way beyond that. Right. So what does our emotional and spiritual evolution look like? Oh, absolutely. You know? I love that you mentioned that too, because it's something that I often think about. And it blows my mind that as humans, with everything that we've achieved, we've somehow not managed to evolve as effectively that way. And I do think that comes back to your point about the way that the world is conditioned and the messaging that we reiterate. Because I do think, like to tie it back to the first part of the conversation related to our perceptions and our perspective on God and our relationship to that, is that there are so many things that have held humanity back on an emotional and spiritual evolutionary level. Like I, there's this, I remember watching a documentary about Galileo and basically people thought he was crazy for understanding, you know, sort of the cosmos as he did. And it set back science like 200 years. And you think about that and you're like, how many mistakes are we making as human beings that are just, they're, they're rooted in fear of the unknown. And so rather than pursuing something that is uncomfortable and trying to see what happens, we stay where we are and we dig our heels in and we try to convince the people around us that this is the right way to do it because that's what is comfortable or that's what's safe. And in reality, that might not be safe because to your point, while everything else around us is evolving, we should be adapting with that. And I think that's sort of the adapt or die mentality of survival of the fittest, right? Like we need to be adapting more. Of course. And, you know, we need to start looking at not just survival of I and my safety, but but considering a collective, what does this look like as a collective? If you make a choice or a decision and every action, word and thought, each one of us does, changes the world. Every single one. You know, I remember Jane Goodall, she's um, the environmentalist yep. to the gorillas, I believe. And she um, she said something to the extent of, we shouldn't be asking the question whether we can change the world or not. Because we do. And everything, every word, action, and thought actually changes the world in real time. We need to ask the question, how are we changing the world? And we need to be really honest with ourselves because with that comes the mad responsibility. And I think if as a society and as individuals, we start to really ask that question, then um, a lot will come to light. And we, we might actually realize that a lot of what is normal for us or what has been done for eons and centuries 
does not actually have a positive impact on greater collective. It might serve a very small group of people, you know? For sure. And it actually just reminded me of a quote that I had um, highlighted in your book, which is like, we must have the courage to walk into the darkness and find the light switch so we can illuminate all that needs to be healed. It just really spoke to me because you are touching on this reality that we exist in where we will not pursue those things that make us uncomfortable because we have this idea that the way that it's happening is the way that it should be. Um, and yeah. it holds us back and it keeps us from exploring potential. And to your point, it's like we rely on a couple of people to make these really big impacts in the world. And then for that to somehow proliferate instead of having that personal accountability to the collective and finding ways to bring us all together. And I feel like that's a big part of why I felt really connected to you from our first conversation, because we share that desire for people to find that connection and nurture that connection through the multiplication of relationships and, and bringing yeah. people together in a, a human, but like also a, a human spiritual way, like finding that collective consciousness. And, you know, we see it manifest in certain ways where we look at it and people are like, climate change, right? Like things are happening in the world, things that we're doing or not doing are affecting our ability to sustain our planet. But some people flat out don't want to believe that, which makes it hard for the people who are trying to make the change to actually effectively make those changes. And so we get into these places that are just like purely ego driven. And we are discounting the suffering that is not only happening now, but will perpetuate if we don't kick our egos out and start looking at it from a place of love and a place of community and connection so that we can all thrive. And I, I feel like one of the biggest problems we have is the idea that like people need to have something that is like just so it's purely theirs. It's, it's mine. I have more of it. Yeah. It's like having more of it brings me more power, brings me more wealth. It's like, you're just missing the point. <laughs> yeah. And you know, that's the condition of our society, right, Nikki? It's like so, sometimes you can have convo, conversations with people about it and just be in utter disbelief because they just don't get it. They can't understand. They can't see beyond their own individual experience of life. And I find it really hard. I mean, you mentioned the environment. For me, I would, I would, this could be a generalization that the majority of people who are seeing the global warming is in real or environmental crisis isn't real. It's because if they were to acknowledge it were real, it would have to impact their lifestyles in such a large way that they would just rather not the inconvenience of it all. It's right? cognitive dissonance, right? It's like yeah. if I bury my head in the hole, I don't have to see what's happening. Yeah, yeah, of course. And yeah, it's just, it's, I was going to do something else I had in my head, but now it's gone. It's oh, gone. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's totally do me. I had it. When you're talking, I had it. I had it. And now it's gone. Um, but yeah, it's just so important for us to really look at how we impact the world around us and step up to that responsibility because we do every single thing we do, every post on social media, every conversation. Oh, I now remember. I got it. Yeah. So, and I believe I talk about this in the book as well, but I remember being at a workshop with one of my teachers, Sean Vaughan, and um, she's a yoga teacher. And I don't know if this happened the way I perceived it, but this is how I perceived it, right? That we were talking um Collectively, we're talking about the injustices and misalignments in our world. And she, I felt like she looked at me and said, you, you are wrong. You are what's wrong with everything that's misaligned in the world. And in that moment, I was like, for a moment, it hit me. I was like, what? I was like, but for decades, I've been doing everything I can to make the world a better place. Like, how dare you say that? And this was my teacher, right? She was a friend to me. She was a teacher to me. How dare you tell me that I'm what's wrong with everything in our world? 
And it took me a moment or two to realize and recognize what she was saying. And this is how I, I my interpretation of it, right? Because I don't want to put words in, in her mouth. But we have this convenient little thing we do where if we want, if we, let's say we're talking about love. And we want to show up more from a place of, from a place of love in our relationships. We look at all the areas of our life and our relationships where we show up from a place of love. But we're not going to look at all the areas of our life where we don't. Mm. And I think that's what that's what landed for me. It's sure I was trying to make real a better place, live from a place of love, forgive people, feed people. But what about that time when I walked? down the street and I walked past a hungry person and didn't offer food. But that time a homeless person asked me for food and and I de- I was caught up. I was too busy. So I didn't I didn't provide. What about that one time when I was snappy or when I was jealous or when I was greedy or when I was emotionally reactive or when I created separation and otherness or made someone feel judged? All those things have a resonance and a vibration that create the world we live in. And it's really convenient to see that little old me, I can't make a difference. But we do make a difference. And there are 8 billion of us and change. So, you know, every time we make a choice, every time we make a decision, we need to look at what is the resonance, what is the vibration of that, that action, that choice. You know, how does it feel to people? And I'll share this is last year I went in, it's getting more and more common. So people may have heard of it. I went into a dark room experience where I, I sat in darkness for a period of time, solitary, absolute darkness in the absence of light. And I went into that room asking a question or recognizing that everything I define myself by is in the external world. I am a human being because right now I'm sitting on a chair, so I'm no different, right? I am male because someone else is female, or I identify as male, right? Or I, I believe in X because someone else believes in Z. Almost everything we identify with is rooted in the external world. For sure, yeah. So, so my question was, if I remove the external world, who am I? Who was I? If I removed as much of the external world in that room of absolute darkness, which is me and my mind and God or spirit, who was I? Who am I? And one thing I realized in that room, Nikki, was this. And I'll try to explain it really clearly. And this is how I know I will not cease to exist beyond my body. None of us will ever cease to exist beyond our body. Because we are not our bodies. What we are is the resonance and vibration of our relationships. That is, every interaction and every conversation we have impacts the other person. We can walk in a room and not say a word and we can impact everyone in that room. And the the energy and resonance and vibration in which we make someone feel and what they feel, that lives with them forever. From this point on, Troy and Nikki will not be the same ever again because we've shared this time and this space. We have now changed one another through this conversation. And for our listeners, you're not going to be the same either. So me and Nikki now live in you. And therefore, we live in every word, action, and thought that you occupy. And then you will have relationships and conversations with other people, and we will live in those too. So this is what I mean by I came to recognize and realize that what we are is the resonance and vibration of our relationships. We are our relationships. Oh my gosh. I just love how that came together, Troy. I feel it on such a visceral level. It's so true. It is the thing that I feel so 
aligned with in my purpose as well. Um, the way that you bring up vibrational experience, right? The resonance. Um, it was something that I did want to talk to you about. So I'm so glad that you mentioned it because you speak about, you know, how the vibrations of love and fear impact how we show up in the world as well. And the conversations that we have now moving forward, the conversations we've had in the past, the experiences from like childhood that I think about things that I, I regret doing as a child, thinking about how I might've made somebody feel. It's a balance of not like carrying that with you in a way that condemns you for it. Like we have to recognize our humanness in that. Um, and the ego and the other decisions that we make that ultimately allow us to maybe make choices we wouldn't otherwise make now. And then there's the way that we consider all of this moving forward and that you and I having this conversation at a point in my life where I'm feeling optimistic about what I have, um, leaving my tech career, going through the process of like going all in on myself. But there's this piece of fear that I have this it's like I can feel the resonance of that fear blocking me from moving forward in certain relationships that I have my relationship with myself primarily and it requires us to step away from what we're feeling like you said with the external pressures and means that we have to kind of isolate like what is going on in the present moment for us to really be able to say, okay, what is the outcome of what I'm doing and what I'm projecting and who I ultimately am? Um, yeah. I feel like I may have just kind of reiterated your point, but more just that it's it's validating to hear it that way and to recognize that that's something else that we are not alone in. Like we... Yeah we have to be open to the conversations and know that the ones that impact us, even when they're seemingly negative, there's something that comes from that, you know? Um, like if we don't address these dark spots, as you point out, they remain kind of shrouded and they weigh us down. And it's sort of this submerged vibration that we ignore, but it's still there. So whether we're joyful and we bring that to our life and our conversations and everything else that we're doing henceforth, but we never address this part that is still there vibrating with negativity or fear or anxiety or whatever it is, then like there's always going to be some sort of um, disconnect there within ourselves. Yeah. And I know what, um, what I think it's also important to mention here, Nikki, is that, you know, we have this, and I don't know how I explain this in the book, actually, I can't remember, but we have this idea that where well, love would be light and flowery and energetic, and fear would be heavy and anxiety and uncomfortable and cause us suffering. Well, that's not always the case, because sometimes we love so deeply that that creates anxiety. And sometimes we have to do things or make decisions that might hurt someone else. But that doesn't mean it was the wrong decision. That doesn't mean it was a decision from fear. Every decision we make can come from either love or fear. It can come from love or fear, any decision, right? Regardless of what it is, whether it be leaving someone you love or making a decision to enter a relationship or hell, we just came out of a pandemic. For me, I remember, and not to jump into it, but someone could, made a decision, could have made a decision to get vaccinated out of fear or out of love, right? Yeah. The only person that knows is that person. Mm. And that's why the introspection is so important for us to really look at our choices, look at how we feel, and be very honest with ourselves. Why am I making this decision? What is driving me to make this decision, right? Is it my own security, my own needs, my wants, my desires, my comfort? Or is it in love and service of something greater than myself? 
you know, and we have to really look at that because no one else can tell any one of us where that decision or choice is coming from. That's a very individual thing that each one of us has to be in relationship to. Mm-hmm. I just want to say yes. <laughs> it's it's so true. And it's I'm so glad that you mentioned that about the relationship with love and fear in that way, because it was actually um, part of what I had pulled from your book that I that I was thinking specifically and that basically everything you do say or think originates from a place of love or fear. And I, I see and acknowledge that in myself and in other people when even just we have to broach difficult subjects um, with people that we care about. Um, whether that's in a personal relationship or a professional relationship. And sometimes we don't say the things that we feel we should say or want to say or need to say because we're worried about what somebody thinks. So even if it's coming from a place of love, we're afraid of how somebody might react. And then we don't say what we should have said. And we, I think, miss opportunities to create more connection because we don't identify exactly yes. what you're talking about so let me put a pin there nikki because i don't want to lose his part and i think it's really important that same exact situation you just mentioned if i have something to tell you because i love you right and i know what i have to tell you is going to hurt you and i'm afraid of your reaction so i'm afraid that i might lose you what kind of love is that that's a self-saving love that's a self-saving love. I'm going to hold back what I know you need to know to hear to facilitate your growth and transformation because I'm afraid that you might walk away from it. Well, and then it also indicates potentially that that person would only have conditional love for you if you're honest with them and they can't receive that. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, you know, I think there's this part in the book where, where I see that I'm, I'm not sure I don't believe you can really love someone unless you're willing to lose. Because if not, that relationship is always codependent. Mm -hmm. It's always going to have this subtle codependence in which, in which you, you're trying to keep them close, keep them in your life, keep them yours so they can bring all that goodness into your life so you're not going to rock your boat. Mm -hmm. They're not going to hold a mirror up and show them what they really need to see. I love that you, you mentioned know? the codependent aspect of that too, because I, I've i felt that in my past relationships. And one of the things that was so valuable for me to learn in the course of my life has been that I used to think codependency was one person taking and not always, <clears throat> excuse me, and not always somebody giving too much or, or holding on too much. Right. Um, and I, I feel like that's just such a valuable perspective that you offered because codependence is something that we allow ourselves to do often in a state of fear. And you point this out in the book, masking it as love a little bit and yeah. not even on a conscious level. I think that's when you get into doing the work and recognizing, is this a pattern of behavior? What is that pattern of behavior rooted in? And the thing is, is sometimes it can be combined with love and fear, but you need to be able to isolate those emotions and those ideas to be able to really establish like where you're coming from at the core and then to kind of close the gap and, and get to a place where you really grasp the reasoning behind it. And ultimately, and I think this is kind of the point that you make throughout the book and just in, in your overall message is we are capable of changing and we are capable of evolving in ways that we don't even understand yet. But in order to do that, you have to take that leap. You have to make the decision to say, I'm going to be uncomfortable with the unknown coming from a place of love and hope and faith, which you mentioned all of these things in the book and, and the different um, dynamics between them. But if you never allow yourself to sit with the discomfort, like you're just inherently blocking yourself from that necessary growth. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what, what also this perspective makes it easier, like this discomfort and these hard decisions, this perspective here makes it a little bit easier. And that is this. 
No one's going to remember, Nikki. At some point, no one's going to remember what we did, what we said, who Nikki is, who Troy is, or that we even existed. That's no one's going to remember <laughs> us. No one's going to remember us or what we did or mistakes we made or our achievements. Yeah. But you see that vibration and resonance that we bring to the world in what we do, say and think, or that opportunity for growth and transformation that we present to people and ourselves, that is what begins to shift collective human consciousness. And that is where we live for it. In that. Or anywhere outside of that, we, we'll be forgotten one day. No one remember who we are yeah. at all in any way. Yeah, we become irrelevant just as a product of evolution. And I really appreciate that you put it that way too, where there is this ability to impact really just, I don't even want to say humanity because it's not just humanity. It's universally, right? To have that universal impact on a vibrational level. And this is something that if you had told me five, 10 years ago that I would be having conversations like this, I probably would have been really dismissive because I was ignorant. I didn't understand how much energy and spiritual connection and emotional intelligence, honestly, played in our the, the way that things manifest in reality for us. And yeah. I feel like we're at a point now where so many people are trying to help others understand that. And because of the way that we can connect with each other virtually, and you're able to proliferate those messages more and more that I do see a coming together in a much more significant way than I, I think I could have ever imagined. And to be able to be part of that by having conversations with people such as yourself to enlighten me, to bring to the forefront things that maybe I haven't wanted to confront or wouldn't consider the next time I'm thinking about certain things, right? Like it just, as you said, it transforms really the, the underlying connection that we all have. And we don't see that ripple effect necessarily in, you know, the next five or 10 years after this, but that creates a healthier dynamic. Even just looking at the way people parent children now is really different and the way that they're addressing emotional intelligence and the needs of their children. And it's like, so then what does the generation after that look like? The the yeah. kids that we can't even imagine to come next, like where will they be emotionally? And it's like understanding what we do now about all that interconnectivity and then factoring in also the amount of people who are breaking traumatic cycles and kind of freeing future generations from that. Like to me, that is just such a magical, beautiful thing that we have as an opportunity in the world that we're in today, in the bodies that we're in today. And I just, I love the way that you tie that together as part of that eternal uh, living that we get to do that, yeah. that breath that we feed into the rest of the world. Yeah, absolutely. And as you mentioned, breath, you know, Nikki, it's like, I try not to talk to woo mumbo jumbo. Like, the fact that I actually use words like energy and vibration and resonance, to me, I try to use them really cautiously because I like to believe I talk in really tangible like, I want people to, to, this is real life stuff. This is not like hippie dippy mumbo jumbo stuff, you know? I love that you said that. Sorry, I just have to say, I love that you said that because my initial thought was like, I would have said things like this were woo woo like a decade ago. Yeah. But it's, but vibrations, that is tangible. Like, it's, Man, it's, it's tangible. science. It's science, right? You could, you, I could walk in a room and you could feel me walk in a room. Or you yeah. could, someone could sit on next to you and they, they, their mood might be off. They might be going through some stuff and you can feel it. Yeah. You know, you can feel it. It's just, it's so obvious. It's it's, it's science. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed, right? Um, but what I wanted to say is this. That was a disclaimer to what I'm about to say, right? Is I connect to breath being some some form of divine agency. There's some kind of divine agency in breath to me. I, I can feel it in my yoga practice. I can feel it in my life. And um, I teach it, right? And when I began to realize that and began to recognize 
or, or learn of the anatomy of breath and how breath actually worked in our body, which could be another podcast. But um, I began to realize that my yoga practice, when I got to my yoga mat, that was actually a form of prayer. That that was my intimate time with spirit and God moving and breathing together, right? And it became a very spiritual practice to me. But then I began to realize, as I go, hold on. I breathe 23,000 times a day. Like if I understand breath as divine agency, that breath is moving through me 23,000 times a day. So I, I took on the perspective and the understanding that each one of us, we are living embodiments of prayer. And manifestation, you know, we love this word now. It's just a new age word for you, man. Prayer. Manifestation is prayer. That's all it is, right? It's the same thing. And everything we do and say and think is actually prayer. It's actually a form of manifestation. But what we've done again is we've conveniently said, well, I'm going to pray in the morning and pray in the afternoon. Or I'm going to do this ritual with sage and crystals and I'm going to manifest stuff in my life every night. But what about outside of that? If every word, every thought and action is a prayer, all of it contributes to the world we're creating and what we're manifesting, not just for ourselves, but for everyone else. And I feel that what we need to do is bring more intention to the way in which we live our lives, rather than, you know, we live in a world where we're all on automatic, we're all on mechanical, Mm -hmm. we've all been programmed. And this to me is the power of practices like yoga, I'm not here to like yoga, yoga, but practices like yoga or meditation or tai chi or anything that allows someone just for a moment to stop, to create that space of, of introspection and reflection and then take that into our lives because we need to live our lives more intentionally. I 100% agree with you on that. And I find that when I am out of practice, when because I do my best to meditate pretty regularly. And the past few weeks I hadn't been, and I had been paying way too much attention to the political landscape. And I feel that my wife and I talk about this all the time. Like you feel the shift in your energy and it's like, you want to be aware of what's happening in the world around you. So you can understand like what the situation is, especially when it's chaotic, but it's also really important for us to not live in that vibration of chaos and anxiety and fear. And what I found was really helpful for me when I became more regular in practicing meditation and even just um, kind of overall meditative healing is that at night, if I can't fall asleep, I will listen to uh, like sound bowl uh, or sound baths or um, sleep hypnosis. But in the morning when I would be really stressed out, anxious about going to work, I would listen to a meditation before I got up because I recognized that if I'm waking up with this anxiety because I don't want to go to the job that I have, there is something within my control about how, or at least however much perceived control we can have as a human being. I can change my mindset. I don't have to wake up in a panic feeling anxious that I have to go to these meetings and do all this stuff during the day. I can wake up and take solace in the knowing that I'm connected to myself, I'm connected to the world around me and that I'm capable of doing things that I want to do or being a way that I want to be. And getting into that space of consistency, I have seen the emotional progress, but I've also felt the physical impact of doing that and sitting with myself and being able to recognize those negative patterns that I have and or or not even negative because i i know that some people will say like there's no good or bad but it's like these vibrations that weigh me down versus those that lift me up yeah yeah and of course depending where you are is what you have to often give the people around you you know mm-hmm. oh yeah absolutely and yeah. i mean with that in mind i know we're kind of rounding out the conversation here this has just been 
such a pleasure to speak with you, Troy, and, and to hear your insights. I feel such an immense amount of gratitude for the way that you view all of this. It's like, I almost want to say the world, but that's not even what it is, right? It's like our connectedness and our ability to look inward is really inspiring. Um, as you said, having this conversation, you know, it, it fundamentally changes in some way, each of us and, and listeners. And I, say that with the utmost confidence because there have been a couple of times in this conversation where I've just been like, yes, I, I'm like actively introspecting <laughs> as you're saying yeah. the words and recognizing that we always have the opportunity to shift our perspective, to realign ourselves with things that feel more right within ourselves. Um, so as we're closing out the conversation, what is it that you feel is important for people to walk away with when they're thinking about, you know, the idea of identity or love and how that relates to our ability to be more connected um, as as human beings, but also in um, the spiritual sense? Yeah, I would. Um, well, all right. Well, let me offer this. I believe that. Um, Love and God are there everywhere. There's no way that love and God do not exist. And I know that it's really hard for some of us to hear and to consider looking at our world and some parts of our world are really dark and really heavy and there's immense suffering. So it, it's hard to accept that all of the time. But I want to offer two things, right? Two perspectives. One is that love exists everywhere. And the question we should be asking is not, is this love or is this not love? We should be asking what is being loved? You know, and we should be asking ourselves or looking at any other situation because let's take, for instance, an oppressor or power or greed. Those are, those are all still that's the love. It's just self-love. It's a love of power. It's a love of personal desire. Mm. It's a love of my needs, my wants, right? And um, but it's still love. If we look at a situation and we say that is not love, then we are saying that situation is devoid of love. And if something is devoid of love, then it's dead. But if we can acknowledge what is being loved and acknowledge how that love can be selfish or self-serving, then we can work on shifting that love to serve something greater or shifting that love to, to the, the external world around us, to, to be of service, right? How can we use our love to be of service and love something greater than ourselves? Does that make sense so far? It makes total sense. I was about to attempt to dispute you on that point, but then you brought it all together. So I am with you. I am tracking. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good, good. I know I, I, I sometimes I speak and I can sense people like we think the pounds. <laughs> right. Uh, I was like, I'm going to let you go with it. Let's see. Let's see where it lands. No, yeah. because I, my immediate thought is I'm thinking about greed and, and people who are so power hungry, yeah. but the way that you speak to it, it's effectively pointing love in a different direction and broadening it because it's yeah. it's egocentric at that point. And yeah. it's, so it's more about dispersing it. Um, so I'm yeah. with you 100%. Continue. Exactly. And the second thing I want to say, because someone, someone asked me this the other day, and it's a hard conversation to have. And here's the reality, Nikki. I don't know. I have no answers. But... What I'm about to share is a perspective that I connect to and I believe in and I know to be true for me because it's the only thing that helps me make sense of our world. It's the only thing that helps me make sense of our world. And that is connecting to this, this understanding that, listen, we are not our bodies. And this human experience is some intricately designed school, spiritual school of life in some way. And we have not come here 
It's not like Walt Disney, let's go and write and have fun on planet Earth in a human experience. Like in some way, we've come here to, to learn and to grow, to facilitate our growth and transformation in some way, right? And, and that means it's going to be really sticky, uncomfortable, heavy, and even painful at times. There'll probably be a lot of that. But the reality is that that will pass. That, that Whether it be a lifetime or a generation, that lifetime, that suffering that someone has to experience, that pain that we experience from time to time, or that some individuals may experience for their entire lives, that too will pass. It doesn't mean that it's not real. It doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt. But to help us make sense of it, for me, it's just like, I know that will pass. I know that that person's circumstances, whether it passes when they leave their body or during their lifetime, that this moment in time is just a speck. It's just a mere speck in our evolution, spiritually, emotionally, and otherwise. And that we have come here all to experience different things. Each one of us, we have a different curriculum to walk. And some of us are in grade two, some of us might be in grade 22, and some of them might be really sticky and uncomfortable, and some of us may have tutors at home, yeah. right? But um, it's the only thing that for me helps us make sense, helps me make sense of the human experience. And I remember once someone someone asked, well, do I ever get down or depressed or sad? And yeah, of course I do. Of course I do. I, I know I'm a bachelor. I'm 43. I have no kids. I always say it's not hard for me to disappear and walk away from society and go and sit for myself for the rest of my life. That's not hard for me to do. But... When I feel down and I feel heavy and I look at the world around and I want to walk away or I want to give up or throw a tantrum, I allow myself that space to feel it because I think it's important to feel it. It's part of the experience. But then there's a voice that comes up in my head. And that voice is, is one I heard from my same teacher, Sean Cohen, at some point. And it's a voice that says, how dare you? How dare you, with all you've been given, with all the blessings, all your opportunities, all the knowledge you've been given, how dare you not at least try just for a moment, in every moment, in every breath, just to try with all you can to make you with a better place. And I think for all of us, we need to, in that moment, just ask ourselves that question, how dare we not at least try? That's a fantastic answer to the question. Um, I, it honestly almost brought me to tears. I really am so lucky to have had this opportunity to share the mic with you, Troy. It's hard to explain how deeply those last words that you just shared are impacting me in this moment. I don't find myself speechless very often. <laughs> um, but there's something at my core that I'm feeling that is recognition of not of not allowing myself to accept defeat of bringing to the forefront like the desire to create change and not taking away that opportunity with just my own self-limiting beliefs or limiting beliefs of the world around us and like what we're actually capable of together. I hope that this episode and your message resonates as much um, with listeners as it as it has with me. It's really been just such an absolute gift to hear your perspective and to imbibe your energy. It, it really translates even through a video call because the sincerity with which you speak about your perspectives, your beliefs, your desire to help heal humanity in these ways and it just 
it's so powerful, Troy. And I, I'm so lucky to have had this opportunity to chat with you. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, well, Nikki, thank you so much for having me. And um, it really means the world. And like you, I can feel this. And and it really is so beautiful to be here. And I feel honored. And I want to say for listeners, I don't know if people often recognize what it takes to be a podcast host and to create a show like this. But I want to say thank you because... For listeners who might not be aware, like it takes so much work um, to bring something like this together and then to keep 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 it running and stay committed to it and stay committed to how you want to impact the world and listeners. So I want to tell you, thank you for that. And thank you for that. Thank you so much. And I'll so be back much. anytime. Yes, I absolutely. I yeah. hope to be visiting Trinidad sometime um, because reading uh reading your book i just felt like oh my gosh it would be such a transformative experience um the the detail with which you share just sort of you getting started in um your new home and all of those things it just uh, it it pulled me right into the experience um so thank you so much and gang that's all for this episode of who the fuck we'll catch you on the flip side right love Thanks for listening to Who the Fuck. And if you like what you hear, share the show with your friends, family, coworkers, or anyone else you think needs a healthy dose of introspection and raw authenticity. Feel free to rate and review wherever you get your podcasts. It's always appreciated. And you can also visit whothefck.com to keep up to date with what's new in my world and for exclusive bonus content. Catch you on the flip side.